Yes. I had to extract him it's real. from his, from it's real. his location. We're going to take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> There's lube involved. People coming here, they know they're coming to support black artists and black businesses. Schomburg at the Black Comic Book Convention with David Walker. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. So this is not your first year at the Schomburg. This is the fifth year at the Schomburg. This is my third year here. Your third year. Okay. Yes. Is there anything different this year than what there has been in the past? Well, this year it's two days yep. and it's crowded. It's insane. It's always crowded and insane on Saturdays and you can barely move, but it's a beautiful thing. I'm having a great time. So what's different about this versus San Diego versus New York Comic Con? It's all about reaching people and, and, and connecting to community and not about making just money. All those other shows will charge you $50 to get in or $100 to get in, but these shows are free. It's, it's, it's connected to New York Public Library System, so it's all about literacy, it's all about connecting with students and teachers and librarians, and really about the community itself. When you go to a bigger show like New York Comic Con or San Diego Comic Con, they really don't care about us. They care about our money, but they don't care about us. us. Whereas this is about, yeah, it's a little bit about the money too, but it's about us. This is for us, and it's by us, and it's and it's our thing. You're busy. Yeah, I am. I'm you're a little very, busy. Very, yeah. You're a little bit busy. We got Occupy Avengers, um, Power Man and Iron, Iron Fist. Man, yep. Yes, and Lion Forge. Yep. There's about five projects that I can't talk about right now. Right. Yeah. And then there's like five that are actually out that everybody knows about. Yes, exactly. And, and if you haven't already, you guys got to pick up that volume of Nighthawk. Tell us a little bit about indie work versus working for the majors, quote unquote. Well, working for the majors, your work for hire. There's creative freedom, but there's n it's not unlimited creative freedom. There's people you have to answer to and you don't own those characters. Creator owned, it's you, you own it. You're the boss, you're in charge, but it also means you gotta run the business. It's a huge, vast difference and a lot of people don't understand it. And to be able to work in both of those worlds is both a blessing, but it's also really difficult. You might be an indie creator, have a, a, a thousand followers on Twitter or something like that, and then the next day Marvel announces you're writing for him, and then next thing you know you got 10,000 followers on Twitter. More eyes watching you. But it's really more people waiting for you to mess up. We see a lot of the major comic book um, companies putting a lot of effort into female characters, characters of color, because they see us as a viable uh, resource of money. But is it consistent? Is it? Is it really? Are they here to stay? I think that uh, that all they care about is is how much money we spend, and if we're not spending enough, and not being vocal enough about what we're spending it on, then. Well, then it doesn't matter. In terms of the indie stuff, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but people aren't supporting it. Do you, do you think there's a lot of support on social media, but not actually in the wallet? Oh, yeah. People will talk a mean game on social media, but will they spend their money? Showing your support with your dollars in America, in a capitalist society, is the thing that matters the most. And all the praise is, is great, but if you're not buying the book, and the book's not selling, then they're not going to make more of it. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. But I am here with... Micheline Hess. Of Rosarium Publishing and her um, book, Malice in Ovenland, among other things. Ooh, and this music now. You've been coming to the Schomburg for a couple of years. Yes, so, I have. So what has this year been like for you? This year has been awesome. I would say it's been better than last year just because uh, I know what to expect this year. And so far, you the brought people enough who books. are coming, yes, yeah, I brought enough books. The reception was super positive. The panel I was on was really great. Um, when you're coming here, people are coming here to find your work. And they're bringing their kids, or their kids are bringing them. And they're coming to your table, and they're they're seeing everything that you want people to see when you're creating these things. Can you give a brief synopsis of what Mouse and Oven Land is about? Yeah, Mouse and Oven Land is about Lily Brown from Queens who's stuck at home for the summertime doing chores while her, her friends are off doing really cool stuff. And uh, while she's cleaning the oven, she gets sucked down to it into another world populated with creatures who are less than happy to see her. And she has to figure out how to get out of there and back home before she ends up on the menu. 
And what's really interesting, I think, about these creatures is that they're fueled by, like, the grease and the lard and the leftovers and the drippings that were in the back of the oven. But now, like, they're eating healthier, so there's yeah. not that much food or uh, something. Yeah, since Lily's mom transitioned over to healthier food and things that are steamed and baked and things like that, uh, there's a lot less grease coming down into their, you know, falls and into their pool and their reservoir. And so they're having a real difficult time um, switching over or adjusting to the idea of switching over to a healthier diet, which will, of course, mean the end of Greece and the beginning of the unknown. What What is next? Is there another volume? Is there another comic? Or what are we, um, are we animating? <laughs> are we working know. on other properties? I don't know if we're animating yet. Uh, right now I'm exploring creating different properties because I don't have to go into production for the next Malice. Yes, there will be another Malice in Yay. Evanland story arc. <laughs> now I'm just kind of still enjoying not having to be on a constant production schedule of coming home from work and just grinding. So I'm really just enjoying exploring different techniques, trying to learn different things, and just kind of expand a little bit and breathe before I have to go back into it. We have to go back in the weeds. Yes. <laughs> if you uh, go to my Facebook fan page, facebook.com, Ovenland, I'll be trying to keep maintain a calendar that, that talks about what my next appearances are going to be. And guys, go out and buy Ovenland because it is an amazing, amazing book. How many years have you guys been coming to this event? This, this is actually my first year. This is a totally new experience for me. This is my were, second year. You were honored last year. Yes, I was. I they, appreciate it. They had an entire panel dedicated to you. And they have one for him today. Yes, they do. Are you excited about that? Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Have you been before, Brian? Have you been to this? No, this is my first time in the building. The story of Brother Man is about a man battling social apathy in this fictitious city called Big City. That man is Antonio Valor, who's a lawyer. One of the things about Brother Man when it first came out in 1990 is that it was a catalyst for this contemporary black comic movement. We were basically going up against an established comic book system that we really felt the resistance when we were pushing in the early years, but we still managed to sell up to 750,000 books independently. That's what the original books, and that's how we, we got rolling on that. And I'll bring you to the uh, graphic novel. Okay. The graphic novel after 20 years. And that's Revelation. The that's Revelation. Okay. Brother Man Revelation decided to start with the origin story. Not start Starting with Brother Man Antonio Valor, but we're taking a step back to, and those are his uh, parents right behind us on the poster, to start with his family to, to, to learn what was the grounding that would create a man who would want to stand up to the social apathy in his community. Let me also draw your attention, we have our uh, Duke Denham Detective Series. That's a series based on a character from the Brother Man comics. We wanted to jump back in history to when the district attorney was a private detective. What's your process? Do you actually paint or use ink and then scan it in, or is it all digital? Yeah, it's all digital. We storyboarded the entire book uh, in grayscale, mm -hmm. just to establish light sources like you know shadow, mood, and um, I mean I'm I'm very much into cinematography, photography. I tried to use light to tell the story. And you did an amazing job, and the color palette you used is really really beautiful. What is the benefits and uh, some of the hangups with digital versus print, even with color? Because I know. Some Sometimes you have to format things differently. One of the benefits of, of digital is just the fact that our society is going digital. Even the drawing of the book, there's no paper involved. Brian and I, we actually met at Cartoon Network. Oh, nice. So we were doing like storyboards and production art. And when the technology pretty much changed up, that's when I became accustomed to mm -hmm. really getting rid of the pencil. Even though I still like that Yeah. in terms of moving fast and getting the job done. There's nothing like it. Is there another book? Is there another part to Revelation coming out? It's actually with the three, same it's a three point three part series and we're working on uh, part two right now. And our thing is, you know, we, we, we want to create things that are timeless. We're not trying to rush it out just to get it to a couple of hundred mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. when you can create something that's dynamic and it lasts for decades mm -hmm. and eventually reaches millions of people. And you have another project that you were yes. mentioning that's coming I'm out. I'm working with a, a young lady, Angel Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, she's an artist that uh, Dawood brought to my attention. And it's a story called Keisha. 
story of a, a group of engineers, mm -hmm. young black engineers, who decide we're going to create the ultimate artificial intelligence. Right. Everything doesn't work, mm. and there's a whole lot of problems that go on, and that's the story of, of, of Keisha, and it's going to be hosted on the Black Science Fiction Society website starting in February. Wonderful. Now, where can we buy all of this, and where can we find you guys online? Well, you can pull your wallet out right now. <laughs> you can go to uh, brothermancomics.com. Okay. Also, uh, Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Com, books a million. Thank you guys so much. Once again, at the Schomburg at the Black Comic at Book Convention oh, with the Brotherman crew. Thanks, guys. I can't tell you how honored I am, how proud I am. I mean, when myself and Deirdre and Jerry and Jonathan were concocting this, I mean, we didn't even know, you know, that people would come. It's pretty amazing, you know. And I'm, He's tearing oh, up, guys. I'm a little bit, <laughs> a little bit teary. It's like a, um, a family reunion. I get way more hugs here than I do a Santa. <laughs> Nobody's talking you. Hugs. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's talking mm -hmm. you. No, Octavia Butler's Kindred is a pretty famous, one of her most famous works. Yes. How did you guys get this, and what was that process like? He met uh, editor at Abrams Comic Arts, uh, Sheila Keenan. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, he was showing her art from this project we were working on called Graffiti Monster Killer. Because oh, Graffiti Monster Killer. Yes, but he showed her the art. And she was like, have you heard of Octavia Butler? There's this kindred thing. Well, I'm like, wow. Yeah. And then, and then, <laughs> yes. You know. Yes, I've heard of her. So five months later, we're signing a contract. It and worked every out. every day of those five months, I was like, there's no way this is going to happen. There is no, no way. way. Yeah. Yes way. Yes way. You are a writer. I'm the writer. And yep. you are the artist. Yeah. He's also a letterer. And a letterer. And you're also a letterer. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it like adapting somebody else's work? What's that process like? I mean, it was a lot of uh, concern to do justice to the work, to do justice to Octavia Butler's memory, yes. mm -hmm. to make something that fans of the novel would like. You know, there's a lot of weight to the history, and also just the, the subject matter is difficult because Kindred is a horror story. Along with uh, Sheila Keenan, our editor, we're like very cognizant and very careful to maintain the perspective of the story, to yeah. be, you know, historically realistic. It's like these horrible things happened, mm -hmm. but do it in a way that serves the story and not is not like exploitative. Yeah. To, to yeah. a certain degree, I mean, we kind of relied on the on the respite of the fact that comics are like a abstract medium, and so we actually use the fact that you could do cartooning and use vibrant color to kind of like distance ourselves from it a right. little bit. You know, it's so powerful that when I was drawing it out, I mean, I really couldn't circle back. I had to circle back to it later. And I've said this many times, literally, I literally wept onto the original art. Are you both doing things individually? Are you collaborating yes, on something I, else? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're all collaborating on things. new things, with all of the things. Black Comics Returns is the sequel to our 2010 art book, Black Comics, African American Independent Comics, Art and Culture. Oh, cool. I wow. did it. That's oh. like S.H.I.E.L.D. Y'all need to come up with a shorter name. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's That's why the second book is called Black Comics Comic Returns. That's it. Exclamation point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is what happens when professors make titles for things. Yeah. Please, Thank please, you. guys, get out there. Buy this book so that we can get more. Like, they can do more of Octavia Butler's stuff. That would stuff be cool. We'd love because to do Because Parable of the Sower would be amazing. That's a good as book. As a graphic novel. I am hiding in a closet <laughs> oh, in the back of the Schomburg with Marcus Williams of Tuskegee Airs. Yes. And Greg, his partner, Greg Burnham. Sorry you couldn't be back here, buddy. It'll be all right. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, how many years have you been coming to Schomburg? One, including this, is... this one. <laughs> okay, what do you think? It's amazing. And uh, you have to remember to look up, talk to humans. Great, great reception so far. So tell us about Tuskegee Airs and what the story is actually right. about. Uh, Tuskegee Airs is a futuristic sci-fi action adventure set 80 years into the future from today. Uh, they're being uh, mentored. Five young pilots are being mentored by a fictional descendant of the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, he's trying to get them prepared for this war with this machine army that's coming. Uh, man flight is illegal, so he's teaching them in secret. Uh, once the war hits, their planes, the P-51 Mustangs from World War II, don't really hold up. Uh, they need an upgrade. They, they get these really cool jets that transform into giant robots. And then that's where, you know, you got the sci-fi action adventure, history, and a Jedi mind trick over kids thinking, you know, oh, this is great, but they're learning history. Is it, is it like a five-book series, six-book series? Yeah. Is there going to be like a TPB? We're going to we're gonna pause on the five, uh, the six books all together. Mm -hmm. It's uh, two graphic novels. We're trying to unravel the, the story, uh, every issue. I want Netflix. If they won't have us, we'll go to wherever we need, get it animated, and put it on YouTube. What has it been like now that... 
Kickstarter's over, comic is out. What has that reception been like? It is weird because we've been living with the comic for a while. Kind of like you, you have kids, you know, you raise your kids well, and then you get them out in the world and stuff, and people are like, oh my God, your kid's so good. They're so well behaved. And you're like, yeah, I did that. Do you normally do books for kids, comic books for kids? or? Well, as a parent, I'm like, what would I want to introduce to my kids? I've talked to parents at comic conventions, and they say the same thing, like, dude, what do you have for my kids? Supernatural. She got a new name. Yes. The Supernatural Woman. Yes. Got you. Legally. We can say yeah, this now. Yeah. So I will be hitting the printers in like the next few weeks after that. this. That, you, you actually did that comic before yes. Tuskegee. Mm-hmm. Okay. It, I think it's pleasantly affected the story though because okay. it just matured. Like, Still for kids. Teenager yeah, and yeah. up. Because there's, you know, she gets down. She's violent sometimes. Uh, there's going to be tanks shooting at her. No blood. But yeah. tanks. Thanks. But, you know, there's millions of people that don't mm-hmm. know about it, so mm-hmm. we're going to keep on. And then hopefully, uh, you know, Oprah, George Lucas, uh, his wife, <laughs> anybody else that has that uh, reach, we're going to hopefully come for y'all and give you a book. So. Because that's how marketing works. And, exactly. you know, they're all going to watch my channel. Watch this to, channel. To you sh- you should have been watching this already. Yeah, it's good. Basically. Yeah. Tell your friends.